How was the tutorial? You just learned a super powerful and super useful tool. And now let's talk about when to use GLM. But first, who am I? I'm Memming. And one of my life goals is to get a cat. Hence my lab's name, Catnip Lab. My background is in signal processing, neural computation, neural dynamics, statistical neuroscience, and machine learning. And my research goals include inferring population level effective dynamics to understand the underlying computation and also building real-time tools for analyzing and controlling streaming neural data. You've already met the D4 team led by Jakob Make. And so let's quickly recap the GLM. So there are two things GLMs can do, classification and regression. And it's basically trying to capture the statistical relationship between the inputs and the outputs. Uh, if the output has finite set of classes that are possible, then it's called a classification. Confusingly, logistic regression solves the binary classification problem. Uh, for example, uh, if you're trying to decode whether the stimulus was sweet or lemony from the recorded membrane potential, then this is going to be a classification problem because the input to the regression or the classification problem is uh, continuous membrane potential, but the output are only two. It was either sugar or lemon. You can also do it the other way if you're trying to see how much the intensity of sourness uh, influences the spiking. Let's say you have a spike with one here, no spike is zero. And at the current time, there was no spike. And you want to predict in the next one millisecond whether or not the neuron will spike or not, depending on the influence given by the uh, sourness of the stimuli, then this would be a classification problem because the neuron will either spike or not spike, zero or one. So logistic regression can also solve this. In general, you can use any output, uh, a more general output. In general, you can use continuous or counts as your output, and this is going to become a regression problem. For example, if you're trying to decode the motor intention of an animal, say which angle the animal is going to kick their foot, based on some neural activity, let's say spiking activity, this is going to be a regression because the output variable is continuous. You can use it the opposite way as encoding, where you're presenting the animal with a visual stimuli, let's say a picture of a cat, and you're trying to predict the evoked response in EEG, EEG being a continuous variable, this is going to be a regression problem. And GLMs can help you capture this relationship. Why is GLM good? GLM is particularly good because of multiple characteristics, but one of the key points is that it gives you a unique solution that you can obtain very quickly. This applies to the Gaussian, the Poisson, and the logistic regression uh, GLM that you've already experienced. The optimization is convex, and therefore you can quickly obtain the global unique solution. And you don't have to implement it yourself. There are almost any statistical packages have this implemented already. And this uniqueness property is still true if given a regularization, as long as the regularizer is convex. The L1 and the L2 regularizer uh, that you have experienced are convex, hence you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and having a unique solution when you're modeling data is very important for your interpretation. You don't have to worry about if your solution is inferior to another solution right, from the same model. This could happen in more complex models, uh, more powerful models, and but GLMs, you get a unique solution so that you don't have to worry about this. Okay, so we're gonna explore a series of applications. Let's start by a simple receptive field estimation in the visual area. So in this case, we're gonna discuss input being some visual stimuli uh, and the output being some spikes. So you've done in your tutorial a temporal version of this. I'm going to show you a spatial version. So the stimulus at time t is going to be an image. Let's say this particular uh, 
set of lines are shown to the animal. And we're going to try to model the relationship between the stimulus and the spikes that you're recording from a particular neuron, let's say in the visual system. If we model this as a cascade of a linear, nonlinear, and Poisson spiking, this is often called the LNP cascade, uh, this happens to be a GLM. So let's write it down as a equation form. So x of t here is your covariate. This is your visual stimuli. This is this is going to be the uh, whatever is shown to the animal as visual input. And the theta here, of course, is the parameter, the linear part of GLM. And in particular, this is typically called a receptive field. So this is going to be a spatial receptive field. So basically, it's going to capture different patterns in space that it cares about. Uh, other places are going to be zero. I don't care about this neuron is not modulated by parts of the receptive field that are zero and only features that align with this receptive field. So there's a nonlinear exponential uh, function here, uh, which gives rise to the firing rate lambda, and the spikes are Poisson generated. So this LMP cascade uh, that you can use to capture relations between the, uh, the stimulus and the spikes here uh, will extract this interesting feature that in many neuroscience contexts is very useful to talk about this receptive field. And it really captures what kind of features the neurons care about. The neuron spiking is modulated, whatever, it, whenever it matches the receptive field. Extending this, uh, we can talk about GLMs capturing single neuron dynamics. Let's say you have a neuron and you're recording uh, spikes. So you're binded in one millisecond bin, no spike, no spike, no spike, spike, and so on. And single neuron dynamics is basically trying to say, what is the temporal structure hidden in this sequence of zeros and ones? And one thing you can notice for many neurons is that uh, there will be a no spike followed by a spike. This is called a refractory period. If, if it's always a case that it's zero, if it's, there's always no spike right after a spike, then this is an absolute refractory period. And this relationship could be captured by a GLM. If you consider this yt minus one as a covariate, this is this called so-called a spike history, right? So it, the y of t, the current time bin, will have no spike if the previous time bin had a spike. Right, so how can we express this in GLM? So if we're going to generalize this slightly so that we don't talk about just a single bin as a history, let's consider a four bin history. So we have 0, 0, 0, 001. This is my spike history corresponding to trying to predict this next time step here as y of t. We can do this for every y of t. We can shift this uh, one time bin at a time and try to predict the next one from the past four, next one from the past four, and so on. So you're using the past activity of your own neuron as the covariate to explain the future of your own neuron, making this an autoregressive GLM, auto meaning yourself, right? So let's write this in, uh, in a diagram form. Uh, it's simply adding one more arrow here. So this is the previous LNP model here. You have some stimulus derived, some nonlinearity, some Poisson spiking, and whenever it spikes, you're going to modulate your own firing rate through the spike history filter. So if the spike history filter says strong negative, it's going to say after a spike, subtract a lot of you know number from the firing rate, making your firing rate less. In equation form, we have spiking activity and the firing rate. Now the firing rate will depend on uh, the history of firing of, of the spike pattern at time t. And the firing rate itself will be an exponential of linear things, first term being the stimulus part, which we already talked about, and the second part being the spike history filter. So the spike history as a covariate is y of t is the covariate, and the filter, spike history filter itself, as the parameter. Right? So we're, if we fit the GLM, we're going to extract uh, both the receptive field or the stimulus filter theta x and also the spike history filter theta h. And what can it do? Let's see a simple example here. So here I'm showing you, I'm going to show you a video, but I'm going to first show you the final frame of the video. 
The stimulus here is black. This is x at each time point t, so this is over time. And the blue bump here is theta of x. And the red bump here is the theta of h. Uh, the, the operation here, the linear operation, the stimulus uh, interacting with the stimulus filter is going to be the blue line and vice versa for the red line here. After the exponential, you sum these two up and then take the exponential, you will have this firing rate, the gray lines, and the generated spikes, which are the black lines. So now let's look at the video. What you're seeing here is the stimulus, after it passes through the stimulus filter, becomes smooth, right? Because this is a bump here. You get, you get a bumpy, slightly delayed blue line. And whenever that happens, when this blue line goes up, the firing rate starts going up. And when the firing rate is high enough, it generates a spike. Whenever it generates a spike, the red one kicks in, suppressing the firing for a while, which makes the firing rate close to zero for a while. But then it stops suppressing, and then firing rate goes back up. So the resulting spiking pattern is a very regular periodic firing. So GLMs can make you do this, while a regular pausing process, for example, can never generate this kind of regular firing. Um, what else can it do? It turns out it can do a variety of temporal structures uh, can be captured by these kind of autoregressive GLMs. So for example, spike frequency adaptation can be captured if you use stimulus filter this guy and the history filter in red. You can see that the firing uh, frequency is high at the beginning and then it slows down. This is the adaptation uh, effect that you often see in neurons. You can capture it with a simple autoregressive GLM. It has a linear filter. That's all it that's all you added. You could do inhibition-induced spiking, phasic spiking, where you only spike once when the stimulus comes on, class one spiking, where the firing rate is increased as your stimulus is stronger and gets stronger and stronger, class two firing, where you have a sudden change in firing rate depending on the strength of the stimulus, and so on. So for more examples, uh, look at the Weber and Pillow 2017. All right, moving on to more than one neuron. So this, we're talking about a single neuron dynamics. What can we do about population? If you have, let's say you have two neurons, can we use GLMs to describe these multiple neurons interacting with each other? Let's say you have uh, recorded simultaneously from neuron one, some spikes, from neuron two, some other spikes, and you fit autoregressive GLMs that we just described. So you have uh, stimulus filter, nonlinearity spiking, and history filter for neuron one, and same for neuron two. Now, on top of this, what we want to capture is, does the firing of neuron two, whenever there's a spike in neuron two, how does that modulate neuron number one's firing on top of what it can explain by stimulus drive and the history effect? And to do this, using the GLM framework, is just to add another linear term, because this is generalized linear model after all. In this case, what we're adding is what's so-called the coupling filters, so whenever neuron two fires, it adds this modulation in time to the firing rate of neuron number one and vice versa. This way you can model that relationship between the firing spiking of neuron two to the spiking of neuron one. In equation form, you've already seen the first part from the previous slide. We're just adding another term here. This is the spiking history of neuron two that influences the firing rate of neuron one, lambda one here. Still very linear, still a GLM. This is called a coupled GLM. And this can capture various statistical relationships between multiple neurons, not just two neurons, it could be many, many neurons. Let's say neuron one has a synapse, a strong synaptic connection to neuron two, that should show up as a coupling filter. If it's inhibitory, it would be negative. If it's excitatory, it would be positive, and so on. All right. So it can capture single neuron dynamics. It can do population dynamics. What else can it do? Let me give you yet another example. In this application, we're going to talk about disentangling different effects of events within a trial structure. So oftentimes when 
we're doing animal experiments, the animal will be doing a fixed trial or a random trial many, many times repeatedly, where in each trial there are different events that's going to happen. And the question is, can we use GLMs to disentangle different modulations based on different elements of the task? For example, let's say the animal is looking at the screen. The fixation dot is shown on the screen. The animal looks at it, which initiates the trial. And let's say there are two targets that shows up on the screen at random time. And then there's a visual motion that shows up on the screen that the monkey has to uh, pay attention to. This is the monkey with a cowboy hat. And then the monkey has to make a decision and report the decision of which motion they saw by saccading to one of the two targets. So they will make an eye movement to report and they get rewarded if they're correct. So in this task, if we're recording from a neuron, let's say a neuron from area LIP, uh, you might see something like this. So each row here is a trial that the animal has done this task. And each, tr each trial has a random timing of targets, random timing of motion, and you know, random decision that the animal has made. So we can collect many, many, many trials and align all the trials in terms of, let's say, their uh, motion onset. So the visual motion started showing up at some random time during the trial. And if you look at the firing rate, aligned to this, you'll see a peak and you'll see some modulation depending on how much motion there were and whatnot. But if you align the same set of uh, spike trains and uh, where the behavior was different timing at each, each trial and align them all at the same time to, uh, to the saccade timing where they started moving their eye movement, you'll see there are, there are some commonalities that you couldn't see from the motion aligned version of this. So the question is, if you have a bunch of these trials, just looking at the average firing rate, you can't tell the difference between which part of the modulation is due to the animal making the saccadic eye movement, which one is due to the target showing up, up on the screen, and so on. But you can build a GLM if you do it this way. So it's a temporal GLM as you've done in your tutorial, but now the input covariates here are timings. So the target showing up on the screen at some time will be indicated as, let's say, a 1, and all the other time points there will be 0, which will go through a temporal filter, which modulates the firing rate with the exponential nonlinearity and Poisson spiking. And same for the saccadic timing, uh, saccadic eye movement timing. So in equation form, you can see that it's still a linear form. You have your covariate x1, which is, let's say, the target timing, and x2, which, let's say, that's the saccadic eye movement timing. And you just have to estimate or fit your GLMs to recover these temporal filters. How much modulation does it have in terms of its firing pattern of this particular neuron? So here's how it works. Uh, let me just rehash this for you. So the animal is looking at the uh, uh, fixation point. Two targets show up. That timing is indicated by this arrow, which is you know, all zeros and like one over at this time point. And basically, what the, uh, the linear filter corresponding to this uh, target component would give you the firing rate modulation uh, corresponding to that particular event. And there are multiple events. Remember, there's also the visual motion that shows up on the screen for a certain duration of time, which will modulate the firing rate for a certain shape uh, over time. And the animal will make a saccadic eye movement, one of the two choices. Let's say it made it at this time point to the yellow target, meaning the firing rate was going up like this, or the purple target, the firing rate goes down like this. And to predict the firing rate of this entire trial, you'll add this up, put the exponential nonlinearity, and you will get the firing rate prediction, which you can compare with the data. But unlike the data, firing rate uh, estimated from the data, you know exactly how much you, uh, different components contributed to this computation. So this is another way of using GLMs. Okay, so now that we've talked about behavior that's binary, basically the animal is either making a left choice or a right choice here, let's talk about modeling this, this kind of uh, sensory decision making where you have stimulus coming in and the animal is eventually making a binary choice, left or right. And in the middle, of course, there's a causal process going on in the brain. We're recording from the brain. 
and we're trying to see if we can understand this relationship between the stimulus, how, how is the animal using the stimuli to produce the behavior, or how much can we t talk about the behavior that's going to be generated from the neural activity. So we can build many different models here, but let's talk about the prediction of the behavioral outcome. The behavioral outcome is just binary in these you know, uh, binary choice tasks, which means we can use a logistic regression. Let's say the stimulus comes in, there's a stimulus filter, goes through the logistic nonlinearity, coin toss, and then it will predict left or right. And same for the neural activity. You can use spike trains to predict the, the behavioral output uh, using logistic regression. Okay, so now that we have talked about this relationship between uh, behavior and neural signals, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, caveats and interpreting what you get out of this. What GLM captures is the statistical dependence between variables, and it can arise in many different ways. Um, so there are many pitfalls. So case one, if you build a decoder, it doesn't mean that the brain has access to that information. For example, if you had presented the animal, well, for example, if you had presented to the eye or the retina of the animal, dogs and cats, pictures of dogs and cats, and you got a uh, complete output of the retina, which is going to be processed uh, from the visual system of the animal, you might be able to build a decoder that says, oh, it's a dog or it's a cat, 100% of the time, just from the retinal output. I mean, after all, this is all, the, all that the brain has access to about the pictures that you show the animal. But this does not mean the retina on its own can decode cat or dog. This is you decoding that cat or dog. And if it's not cat or dog or some other feature, some esoteric feature that you have uh, extracted from this, that does not mean the brain has access to it. It might be in a form that the brain cannot extract. So you have to be always careful not to overinterpret what you get from the decoding results. Another case is when you have uh, neural activity that you find correlations with, that does not mean it's always causal. It, it's just correlation. Right. Let's say you had a behavior, let's say you had some input to the system, neuron 1 is doing all the work, this is, this is a hypothetical case, neuron 1 is, you know, the bottleneck is doing all the computation, produces output that controls your behavior, but you happen to be recording from neuron 2, which gets input from neuron 1, but has no causal relation between the sensory input nor the, uh, and the behavior. It's all just reflecting some information through neuron one. And if you analyze using GLMs to predict the behavior or the sensory stimuli from the response of neuron two, you may find you know, significant correlations, you may find some structures, but that does not mean neuron two has anything to do with the actual computation that's going on in the brain. You can perturb neuron two, uh, inject some stimuli to this particular neuron independent of neuron one, that will do nothing to the behavior or the computation. So you must be careful. Case three, if you have uh, fit a couple GLM, for example, and you got a coupling filter that's non-zero, meaning spikes from neuron two are predictive of spikes in neuron one, that doesn't mean there's a synaptic connection. You can see there's an arrow going from the output of neuron two to the input of neuron one, which would happen if there's a synaptic connection, but that's not the only way they could have this kind of correlation. For example, you can easily have a neuron three that you have not recorded from that are, that's giving rise to a common input. This hidden common input will generate a correlation between the firing pattern in neuron one and neuron two, which will be captured by the coupling filter, but that does not mean that there is a synaptic connection from neuron one to neuron two or vice versa. So you have to be careful. Talking about caveats, there's also a possibility that GLM might fail to fit. It's very rare, but it, it could happen if you have a lot of parameters, but very few data points. 
in this case, the numerical optimization may complain about ill-posed optimization problems. Another issue that you can encounter is that if your output is perfectly predictable, if you can decode 100% cat or dog, you might have your regression weights diverge to a very, very large number. This could be a numerical issue that you may face. In both cases, uh, regularization helps. So put an L2 regularizer at least uh, to prevent these issues if you see them, but they're very rare. So you don't have to worry about it in practice. Another limitation of GLM is that GLM is generalized linear model. So it's mostly linear, it's, which makes it easy and it makes it very interpretable. But at the same time, uh, it might not be able to solve arbitrary nonlinear problems, right? The Poisson GLM has an exponential nonlinearity, but it's a fixed nonlinearity. If the relationship is not exponential, let's say it was some complicated function, it might not be perfect. But this should not discourage you from using GLMs for nonlinear problems that are clearly not GLM like. The thing is, most nonlinear problems have a large linear component. You have to remember this. Most nonlinear problems have a large linear component. Meaning, GLMs could predict most of it uh, in practice. So if you fit a GLM, your, your problem is clearly nonlinear. You fit a GLM, if it predicts 90% or 95% of the outcome, it actually is a very good thing. You know, you're not perfectly predicting it, but you're capturing a big component of the predictability. And since it's linear and it's unique solution, it's very practical and it's very interpretable. Of course, you can add more features to make it more complex. So if you recall the polynomial regression from day three, you've seen that you can add features that are polynomial of the original features, right? Or covariates. So your covariate was x of t, but you can add x squared of t as an additional covariate in the GLM. And as long as you treat the x squared of t as a separate covariate, this is still a GLM. It's a quadratic GLM. Likewise, you, can, you don't have to use polynomial basis functions. You can use arbitrary basis functions. You can use radial basis functions, which are like bumps, or you can use sines and cosines if you, if you think those will work well with your problem. As long as your basis functions are fixed and you, you're using those features, the output of the basis function as your features, then the resulting problem is still a GLM and you still benefit from all of the uh, optimization advantages of GLM. Okay, so let's summarize. So when shall we use GLM? If the scientific question or the problem that you want to solve can be posed as a regression or classification problem, you should always try GLM first. GLMs come with some limitations. They're mostly linear. So if you have a very complex input-output relationship that does not have too much of a linear component, you may, you may want to use more powerful machine learning tools to capture such relationship. Uh, GL, for GLMs, we didn't discuss this in detail, but all the variables of interest must be observed. So if there's a hidden neuron or a hidden input that you have not recorded, you may want to use uh, latent variable models. When you're interpreting the GLM weights, make sure that you know that this, these are statistical dependencies and they don't necessarily imply causal relationships. We talked about many applications. Several of them were in neural code analysis. Some of them were in single neuron and population dynamics, behavior analysis, neural engineering to interface between the brain and a machine, and so on. Uh, there are more in the references in the next slide. And looking forward, GLMs as a probabilistic model, they define very well-defined probability, conditional probabilities, which plays very well with Bayesian inference, which you will see in the future. All right, these are the references and good luck using GLMs. Make sure you try them. Bye.